All right. All right. Now, you didn't come here to talk, hear me talk. You came to hear Andy Stepniewski. And so we're very pleased to have Andy tonight as our guest speaker. Uh, he has uh, been a longtime resident of the Yakima area and very familiar with the shrub steppe regions of eastern Washington uh, and all the other habitats of eastern Washington as well. Uh, uh, in my little, little bio document, I hear that uh, Andy Bartbird, the one that got him interested, was a house finch. Mine was like a red winged blackbird. So some of the most common birds tend to be the ones that gather our attention and that's no different for Andy. He identified it as a child and ever since he was deepened in his uh, passion for birds and their place in the environment. Along the way, he's been a ranger among other professors and continues his lifelong naturalist as a lifelong naturalist in some of North America's most splendid environments. And he has developed a special interest in the American West through which he and his wife Ellen have traveled extensively for the past 50 years. During his four decades in the Yakima Valley, he has focused on how birds use the many habitat zones found along the Cascade Range East Slopes and the adjacent Columbia Plateau. Andy wrote The Birds of Yakima County, published in 1999, nine, now out of print, though you may be able to find some on some used book sites. Um, then briefly after that, coming up for air, just a few breaths of air, Andy and his wife, uh, Ellen, immersed themselves in writing the first edition of The Birder's Guide to Washington. Both Andy and Ellen have remained major contributors to that important resource, including the online version. Andy has also shared his love of nature and birds with others, for example, as he conducts a class for the last 17 years called the Shrub Step of Eastern Washington, uh, put on by the Seattle um, Audubon Society, formerly Audubon Society. <laughs> so it is our privilege now to introduce Andy and Vicki. We'll turn it over to uh, Mr. Stepniewski to um, give us a great presentation this evening. Take it away. Thank you, Dave. Am I being heard loud and clear? Yes, you are. Okay. Thank, thank you for the kind introduction and I'll take it away and take us on an armchair tour into Eastern Washington. As a teenage birder in Southern California, from which I hail, uh, I quickly learned that keen in on the habitats was crucial in learning the birds because Southern California has a, a variety of elevations and climate regimes, just like Eastern Washington. So coming to Washington from Southern California, I was well prepared for um, kind of getting a hold of all these environments. So oh. with that, Let's take off to Eastern Washington, which is just a hundred miles over uh, the crest on I-90. It didn't. Should I use this? Wow. First, I want to thank the photographers who contributed many excellent photos to this uh, program. Unless you're a brand newcomer to the Pacific Northwest, you know there's a wet and a dry side to Washington, separated by the Cascade Mountains. And the uh, diagram in the lower left shows why. Pacific storms come in from the Southwest mainly, dump the bulk of their moisture on the windward side, leaving the east side, the leeward side in the rain shadow. Here's the data. Now I'm wanting you all to sort of memorize this. The dark orange is very dry, less than 10 inches. The purple is very wet, above 130 inches. So you see the west side is indeed wet, and the dry side is dry. But notice in the far northeast of the state, there are ranges north-south uh, that become wet again. The storms regroup as they move west from the Cascade Crest. And indeed, in the far northeast, it gets wet again. And also in the southeast, the Blue Mountains. Ah. <clears throat> Elevation is also very important uh, determinant in what birds we might find. Let me go back. There is a fabulous escarpment in the um, 
north central part of the state near Palmer Lake. This would be west of Osoyoos, where Mount Chopaka rises <coughs> more than 7,000 feet above um, the valley floor. And so you have in this compressed um, tran transect habitats from shrub step and riparian all the way up to alpine. Uh, and this is just one example of what you can find in Eastern Washington. Let's back up a bit. To categorize what we see on the ground needs a system. And it so happens a C. Hart Merriam, a federal biologist, I believe, explored the San Francisco and Grand Canyon area back in the late 1800s and formulated these zones from Sonoran to Boreal. Those are on the left and the variety of uh, plants, birds and mammals that could be found within them. This classic scheme survived a long, long time. And that's the um, scheme on the top there. Merriam's life zone concept, lower Sonoran to Arctic Alpine. Biologists and ecologists uh, 50 or so years ago started to quibble with this and said, you know, we need to be more precise. And so they formulated zonation schemes based on the dominant species of plants, often trees. So now you see lower Sonoran or let's say yellow pine belt was transition a hundred years ago, but now it's yellow pine. And this more specific way of naming a vegetation zone has carried on to the present. <clears throat> you can draw any number of transects from the Cascade Crest to the Columbia Basin in Washington and arrive at more or less the same uh, trends as this. This one happens to be from Stampede Pass west of Yakima down to the uh, Columbia River at Priest Rapids. The important thing to note is it's wet at the pass, 92 inches, and it's also cold, 39 degrees mean temperature. And at the Columbia River, it's dry, less than seven inches of precip, and much warmer, almost 18 degrees warmer. And in between is a variety of uh, zones, which we'll talk about, all tied to specific uh, moisture, temperature, and elevation uh, elevations. So the gap biologist who wrote a wonderful study of Washington's vegetation zones came up with a scheme, which I'll adhere to here, from shrub step to alpine. These are the broad zones. And the first thing I want you to notice is, look at how much more complex it is on the east side. East of the Cascade Press with abrupt changes in elevation and very abrupt changes in precipitation, you have this kaleidoscope paint by number scheme. And this isn't all dreamt up. This is really what occurs on the ground. And so this is what we see going from the Cascade Press to the Columbia Basin. And this is leading out four or five. These are the main ones. I'll get to that later. Notice on the west side with more subdued topography, except for the Olympics, the Northeast Olympics in particular, the zones are uh, much simplified, far fewer. <clears throat> so I blundered into natural vegetation of Oregon and Washington, which defines all the zones which I'm gonna talk about in this talk. And here's the data upon which they base their scheme. And this is vegetation communities. Now, hang on, we were talking about zones a minute ago. Now he's talking about communities. Let me just say, in Seattle, you have a city, Seattle, and you have various communities, um, Rainier, Shoreline. Shoreline, 
Queen Anne, et cetera, all within the Seattle city proper, but with different, a different location and different socioeconomic uh, characteristics. Well, the same goes for nature. The real skinny out there in nature is you can define a zone, but within a zone, there are all these communities. So I don't want you to be taking notes here. If any of the innards of what I'm talking about here tonight interest you, the talk is recorded and then you go and get Franklin and Derna, dryness, natural vegetation, and start to study it. I shall warn you though, it's all uh, scientific names, so, but it's no different than the challenge we impose on beginners with our four letter codes of uh, birds, those four letter codes for plants, the first two letters of the scientific names. Anyways, but it turns out the communities we see out in nature are driven primarily by precipitation, soil depth, and slope and aspect. And I'll delve into these just a bit. I'm repeating this slide, not because I'm getting old and I've forgotten to take it out, but this is all important. Just as one example from the Columbia Basin, which is orange, go northeast into that lighter orange color. That represents a different uh, precipitation regime. Uh, you've gone from less than 10 inches to upwards of 20 inches, not far from Spokane. Well, that extra 10 inches spells a huge difference in the vegetation and birds we see on the ground. I mean, that's the first time I mentioned the word birds, isn't it? <laughs> Anyways, we'll get to birds. <clears throat> the soil depth is also critically important. Notice the thin soil in the foreground grows a lot of wildflowers and no tall shrubs. And then suddenly in the background, there's tall shrubs and fewer wildflowers. Well, this is purely a function of um, going from thin soils to deeper soils. And this type of pattern can be seen all over Eastern Washington's uh, lower elevations. So the next time you're out in Eastern Washington, look for these patterns on the ground. These are called lithosols or rock soils. Slope and aspect is very important also. Slope is which direction the slope faces, south, east, yes. north, or west. And aspect is the, um, the orientation, um, like northeast, northwest, and, and so on. So here's above our home in Wapato after a snowstorm. And this sort of pattern repeated over and over and over throughout the year creates a different plant community from the right side, the snowy side, to the left side, the sunny side. And that's discernible on the ground. And the birds know this too. What you see on the right side, the snow, is different on average than what you see on the left side. This is another pattern that's easy to see in nature too. So I'm gonna start at the lowest ecosystem. We could call it zone. I'm gonna call them ecosystems. Um, zone in the shrub step. And it's dry, six to 12 inches of pre-step, named after the step of the broad belt of grassland in Asia, Central Asia. Botanists in the 19th century recognized similar similarities of our step to Asia's, but our step has shrubs. <clears throat> Folks from the west side can readily see the transition from forest to shrub step right around Hayward Hill or Thorpe, around exit 90. Very easy to see on the ground. And what's happening is precip is declining to about 14 inches or less. <clears throat> but much of the year, this landscape is brown. It's in its glory starting about now, March through late May, and then it turns brown. And mm -hmm. most of the activities of birds, mammals, reptiles, and amphibians is concentrated into those three or four months. Here's an example of the glory of the shrub step in April, behind our hill in Wapato. <clears throat> now I said there were communities within the shrub step. So let's, let's talk about some of these. 
the wettest, just below the pine belt, is called the three-tip sagebrush. And it grows to this unique <laughs> shrub, three-tip sagebrush, because of late snow lie. Idaho fescue is a co-dominant, a perennial grass tied to cold climates, which is actually true all over the Northern Hemisphere upland. <coughs> fescue grasses are indicators of a cold, at least a cold winter. If we were to get solar panels in the future, would that mm. be able to do it? Mm. Seem like this so <laughs> so three-tip sagebrush, I'm not gonna get into uh, scientific names, too deeply, but tripartita simply means deeply divided leaves, like your fingers. <clears throat> and this is a high cold and windy habitat. In all these shrub step habitats, the western meadowlark's going to occur. And it's probably the most versatile or you know, plastic member of the shrub step. <clears throat> and if you'll go out in eastern Washington, starting about now, you'll hear the beautiful fresh-like song of the western meadowlark. Actually, it's a blackbird. Vesper sparrows, an LBJ, is also common in this habitat. Not Has not uh, arrived yet, but by April, it will be singing its heart out in the grassy shrub steppe. Also in April, we'll look for the arrival of the Swainson talk. Magnificent raptor who performs this incredible migration and they're heading through uh, Central America and Mexico right now and they're reaching the Southern, Southern states. <clears throat> Coming from South America and filling the grasslands of North America, a million or so of these great birds. One of the real joys of birding the three-tip sagebrush is encountering the grasshopper sparrow, a really furtive but pretty member of its clan with an insect-like song that even if there's a 10 mile an hour wind, you may not hear. Okay, we're gonna go into a different community now by going downhill into drier terrain. It's a different sagebrush, not three tip, but big sagebrush. It's a different grass, not fescue, but blue bunch weed grass. This type of habitat is now scarce in the shrub, shrub step. I'll tell you why later. The teeth are, uh, the leaves are two, not finely divided, hence tridentata. <clears throat> Seasonally, this habitat is full of wildlife. In winter, as Dennis Paulson said, there's no terrestrial habitat in the state with fewer birds. They go somewhere else. They just don't find much to eat when it's cold and snowy. Besides the shrubs and grasses, uh, this community is full of biscuit roots in the genus Lomatia, which are also in the carrot family with the enlarged root like roots like carrots. And it turns out these are the roots that the women harvested in the tribes in the Columbia Basin and provided upwards of half of the annual calories for, for these people. It's a wildflower rich zone too. Here's just one showy flocks. One of the great birds out there is the sage thrasher who's um, you know, and ceaseless, endless song delights all who go out there. When I say it declines with grazing is if you put too many uh, grazing beasts out in this environment, the density of these, these uh, obligates to the sagebrush, they, they decline. I'm not saying they disappear, but they certainly do decline. Same with the brewer sparrow, the commonest sparrow in this particular community. <clears throat> Sadly, the greater sage grouse is in danger of extirpation in the Columbia Basin. Its population, its range has shrunk 
and the numbers in remaining in the dark purple areas are, are greatly reduced almost across its entire range. Notice the two tiny dots of dark purple in Eastern Washington. A big fire during the Labor Day weekend several years ago eliminated 40% of the habitat of this bird in one weekend. Also hugely in decline in Washington is the ferruginous hawk. Um, loss of medium-sized mammals like white-tailed jackrabbit, Townsend's ground squirrel, and others have caused this rather specialist of a raptor to decline. It hasn't been able to uh, adapt to these changing conditions like, say, the red-tailed hawk. We're heading down into the dry, driest and hottest part of the basin. We still have big sagebrush, but replacing a lot of the uh, blue bunch wheatgrass, there's still tufts of blue bunch wheatgrass in this slide, the bright green ones, but there's also all those brown plugs, and that's the Sandberg's bluegrass, which uh, flowers and seeds very early in the season, turns brown early. But notice all the runways between the plugs. It's a bunch grass, but there's lots of uh, dirt between the plugs, and that forms essential habitat for the sagebrush sparrow. You don't see too much of the, this species in the denser uh, blue bunch wheatgrass habitats. It likes the, the runways between the, um, the plugs. It's very patchy in its distribution now due to the invasion of weeds. A wonderful part of the shrub step now very much reduced is the microbiotic crust, algae, bacteria, lichens, and mosses, which historically retarded erosion by wind and water. It's easily damaged by large, uh, you know, by cows, horses, sheep, and it is sadly much reduced. Aha, this is what so much of our shrub step has um, uh, been converted to by invasion of the uh, cheatgrass more than 100 years ago to almost a monoculture of weeds, cheatgrass predominating, and proliferation of rabbit bush brush at the expense of sagebrush. This type of habitat doesn't have the thrasher, doesn't have sagebrush sparrow, no brewer sparrows, certainly no grasshopper sparrows. Uh, but some species are, seem okay with it, like the larkspur, kind of a generalist. <clears throat> Northern extensions of the Great Basin uh, alkaline soil-based vegetation communities occur here. You go to Crab Creek or Lower Grand Coulee, to Toppenish Creek, and you won't find sagebrush, you'll find greasewood, sarcobatus and no bunch grasses, but rather salt grass. And this northernmost extensions of that Great Basin community can be found in Washington. This is good loggerhead shrike habitat. Formerly, at least, long bill curlews occupied these grasslands, sadly reduced, and perhaps within our lifetime, will disappear from the grasslands of Eastern Washington. The same goes for the burrowing owl. It has hugely declined in the 40 years I've been in Eastern Washington. Uh, to the point now it's being studied by WDFW for endangered species status. Um, a community, you'd think I'd run out of communities for the shrub step, wouldn't you? Uh, a major one in the, along the east slopes of the Cascades is bitterbrush and needle and thread grass. Bitter brush is very unlike the sage brushes. It's actually in the rose family and is prime winter forage for the huge deer herds. For example, like in the Metal, Okanagan Highlands region. Familiar cast of birds up there, 
but in, in smaller numbers. It's not really a key shrub step habitat for birds. It's more for big, big mammals, elk and deer. I've mentioned the lithosol or rock soil community. Here's the pattern on the ground. Once again, that ecotone with big sagebrush, the lithosol. Here is yet another sagebrush, the rigid sagebrush. Uh, best place to see this sagebrush is at the Vantage Ginkgo Museum. It's all around the uh, overlook there, along with bitterroots. A much um, loved wildflower is the thyme leaf buckwheat, one of the numerous species of buckwheats which by the way are excellent shrub step pollinators. The default bird out in the lithosol is the horned lark. A wonderful songbird that nests, produces upwards of three broods a year out in the lithosols. You will likely see, if you are out on a warm day, the shorthorn lizard whose diet is mainly ants. <clears throat> a really conspicuous part of the any visit to Eastern Washington, in the lowlands anyways, are the cliff and tailless community. Ice age floods help form these coolies. And river erosion is another agent in the formation. The tailless is that apron of boulders um, shed from the cliffs. These cliffs are important nest sites for raptors, swallows, and wrens. Stay alert, rattlesnakes occur here, up to about 2,000 feet in elevation. Uh, don't bother it, and it won't bother you. Uh, you'll never, if you miss the common raven on a trip to the cliffs in Eastern Washington, um, perhaps uh, you need a guide. <clears throat> the common raptor is the red tail hawk, uh, wide ranging budio across the continent. <clears throat> the commonest small raptor in the, uh, along the cliffs is the American kestrel, low to high habitats. The few remaining golden eagles still love to soar along the cliffs. I think they like marmots now, chuckers. With the loss of jackrabbits, they like uh, uh, marmots, chuckers, California ground squirrels. And I believe prairie falcons are now declining out there, but this month starts their courtship period. So if you're out in Eastern Washington near a cliff and you hear a It's the courtship scream of the prairie falcon. <clears throat> Starting in April, you'll look for the white-throated swift, which nests in these cliffs. A lovely sight is the canyon wren, whose descending chant is always memorable. It's a permanent resident here, foraging for dormant insects in crevices in the cliffs. Its sister species out there, the rock wren, migrates south. And it says, I'm not going to try to find insects in the tailless piles in winter. I'm going to head to uh, Arizona or Southern California. The chucker is an introduced species. And starting now, their rucka, 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 rucka call resounds from the cliffs. Aim your scope or binoculars to the top of the cliffs, and you'll often see one teed up um, as it calls. They like to be at the highest place at this time of year. <clears throat> this, this particular environment is core habitat for common nighthawks one of the last species of birds to return to the Pacific Northwest from South America. The common poor will will start calling in April from these habitats. Poor will, 
Per win, per win. Columbia Basin wetlands, it's not a plant community, but these saline sinks are incredibly important for birds. They're the same Great Basin contingent that you see in Utah, Nevada, Eastern California, Eastern Oregon. And no trip to the Columbia Basin is complete without visiting one of the numerous wetlands. Swanson Lake is a typical alkaline wetland. Right now, the spring migration is in, has started with the early wave. As with flowers in the subalpine meadows, there are different waves. In the middle wave and late last wave have different, different members of the cast. So right now it's the early wave as this ice is just melting. Ruddy duck is always a hit. Watching the male do its courtship display is always a hit. Later in April, shorebirds from the south, such as the still and avocet will arrive. And then the Wilson's phalarope, where the female is more brightly colored than the male. In April too, the yellow-headed blackbird will start singing its kind of awful song. But it's kind of a neat bird to look at. There are so many more wetland species. I'm just going to give you a brief glimpse of the, these other species. These wetlands are important for shorebirds in the fall. And it turns out there are some species more common east of the Cascade Crest than on the coast, such as stilt sandpiper, bairds, and solitary sandpipers. Much easier to find them out here in eastern Washington than on the coast. <clears throat> if I don't mention something about dams, I'll be missing a great part of what's gone on in eastern Washington over the last 60, 70 years. They've transformed the basin. And along with it, there's been a near demise of the glorious salmon runs and the Mid-Columbia Native Americans way of life, a real tragedy. But it's created habitat for species of birds, um, such as greater scop, gulls, loons, that formerly wintered on salt bays along the Pacific coast. And it's tens of thousands of coots. Love Eastern Washington slackwater reservoirs, fair for bald eagles. Agriculture in the Columbia Basin has drawn tens of thousands of sandhill cranes and waterfowl each spring. Now we have the Sandhill Crane Festival. Since I did shrub step classes for 17 oh, years, yeah. I need to, um, I'm compelled to share this slide showing 60% has been converted to other uses. And much of the remainder has been altered by livestock grazing or exotic species. Finally, we're going to go on to something different besides the shrub step. In southern Washington, like a, a Lyle along the Columbia, Klickitat Wildlife Area, Oak Creek Wildlife Area near Yakima, we have northern extensions of the Oregon white oak ecosystem. It's the only oak in, in our part of the world. And acorns, which is also known as mass, provide food for many wildlife. California scrub jay is a characteristic species. This jay has only recently moved north from its stronghold in Plickitat County to uh, Yakima County, and it's spreading north on the west side too. Lewis's woodpeckers, always a great sighting, are. Uh, some are residents in this habitat, and in a few places, permanent residents. A species that's declining, 
perhaps competition from starlings or loss of habitat. <clears throat> Mostly around Lyle, you look for the handful of acorn woodpeckers that um, have crept north across the Columbia River, much more common in Oregon and southwards. The oak habitat is great habitat, core habitat for wild turkeys and the ash-throated flycatcher, a neotropical flycatcher, much more common to the south. <clears throat> Moving uphill in elevation, a little bit wetter than the oak zone, a little bit cooler is the ponderosa pine. Notice it rings the Columbia Basin. <clears throat> Cooper in 1853 was a physician naturalist on the Great Northern Railway surveys. And as he descended the east slopes of the Cascades from the wet, wet side, he was suddenly in a different type of forest, a parkland with these huge ponderosa pines. This is a forest of high biodiversity. And it's a dry forest and subject to frequent fires. <clears throat> this is a zone that um, the Weenus annual Memorial Day camp, camp out is set amidst. And Species always look for include these birds like the white-headed woodpecker, western wood peewee, very common flycatcher, pygmy nuts, pygmy nut hatches, this wiki duck nut hatch, in, mostly in mature pines. Listen for its rubber ducky call. And the white-breasted nuthatch, which is uh, the interior race, quite different from the one in um, uh, coast, southwest coastal Washington, like Ridgefield Re Refuge. <clears throat> the default chickadee in this zone is the mountain chickadee. There'll be black caps in the riparian, but mountain is the common one. <clears throat> and a cyclic or eruptive species is the red crossbill. Turns out there are, there are basically no seeds in the ponderosa pine forest along the Cascade East Slopes this winter. So there are no red crossbill. There are almost none. As is true with Cassin's finches. In a big pine seed year winter, this species will winter but they vacated the east slopes this winter because there's no seeds. As in the sh seeds. shrub step zone, there are communities. And the um, most important community for birds besides the dry open pine forest is the shrub thicket zone. And this is the community that's being most targeted by um, clearing for fire protection. There's almost a uh, incredible drive to get rid of all brush called um, fuels in the ponderosa pine forest because it contributes to a hotter fire. But a very important community for dusky flycatcher, slate-colored fox sparrows, and the gorgeous calliope hummingbird, and Nashville warbler, neotropical migrant. What we mean by this is it retreats to the neotropics to the south of us for winter in the blue area, and migrates north to the red areas for breeding, neotropical migrant. If these brushy patches are favored, favored by lazuli buntings, a bird that loves to sing through the hottest parts of midsummer days. It's unbelievable. It's the only bird singing at midday on a hot July day. <clears throat> a special part of the uh, brushy thickets, um, avifauna is in the Blue Mountains where 
a handful of green-tailed towhees, a great basin species, occur. Now, ain't that a snazzy-looking sparrow? <laughs> While you're down there, take time to visit the Grand Ron and Snake River areas. Awesome, gorgeous, um, and very birdy, too. It's not an oft-visited part of our state, but it's well worth it. <clears throat> In the uh, Ponderosa Pine Zone, historically, there were a lot of cavities, dead and dying trees with woodpecker holes. He's been targeted by logging, which has been intense in the pine zone. And so cavity dependent species like bluebirds have declined. Across the continent, enthusiasts, uh, bird enthusiasts have set up uh, box programs to augment numbers of uh, these bluebirds. And it's really worked. The Yakima Valley Audubon Society has fledged over the last 40 plus years I think it's pretty close to 20,000 bluebirds. Say that to yourself, 20,000, wow. A much sought after species by birders in May and June in the pine forest is the flammulated owl, whose low pitched boot call, moo, 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 moo. I'm gonna stop doing that because I look funny doing it. At any rate, it, it's a cavity nester in the, um, in the pine forest, sometimes mixed with dug firs, and usually on a slope. <clears throat> the riparian ecosystem is the birdiest habitat in eastern Washington. Incredible numbers of birds seasonally. And some really special areas stand out. The Sam Poyle River Valley, south of Republic, for one. But any river valley will have um, a riparian habitat. And this is where structure is, uh, diverse structure is very helpful in creating habitat for a lot of birds. Structure, by that I mean tall trees combined with a shrub layer, combined with a herb layer. If you have all those three elements in the riparian zone, you're likely to have habitat for a lot, a lot of diversity. Cavities are important in this habitat and the flicker is the default excavator. <clears throat> the commonest warbler is the yellow warbler, sadly reduced as it's a frequent cowbird host. This is also habitat for a variety of other pretty common species including the black chin hummingbird and others illustrated here. There's more than just the flicker there in terms of woodpeckers. Turns out the east slope of the Cascades have the highest diversity of woodpeckers or not exceeded by any other um, area on the continent. Maybe matched, but not exceeded. We have 12 species. <clears throat> and sapsuckers are important keystone species as they drill wells that attract uh, hummingbirds and insects and provide food for the sapsucker itself. Kingfishers are always snazzy and fun to watch. Bullock's Oriole is a common bird in the lowlands of eastern Washington, builds this incredible nest that persists through the winter, so it's easy to see where um, Orioles have nested the prior warm season. It's great habitat for cedar waxwings, a late nester, loves berries. <clears throat> the default owl in this habitat is a great horned owl. And yes, it does like your cat. Birders really head to Eastern Washington for a number of Eastern birds in May and June. Perhaps the commonest is the Eastern Kingbird. Least flycatchers, the farther northeast you go in the state, the more likely you are to encounter this Jebek, 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 Jebek flycatcher, the common impedinax of Eastern North America. <clears throat> also, the farther northeast you go in the state, the more common 
is the red-eyed vireo. Gray catbirds are common, as are vireos. In fact, you can see vireos as close to Seattle as um, Bullfrog Pond and also in the Weenus. A lovely song. Important to locating the viri is streamside thickets in the lower conifer zone. If you're too much below the lower conifers, they thin out. They, they don't like the lowest elevations in the state. Red starts, another one. The more northeast you go in the state, the more red starts. Slightly more common are water thrushes. They like boggy areas. A bobolink was originally east of the Rockies, spread west apparently with irrigation. And that's always a great bird, a target bird for trips to Eastern Washington. <clears throat> I would be remiss if I didn't talk about vagrant searching in the Tri-Cities, Walla Walla or Washtucna areas. Each spring and fall, there are a lot of birders targeting wet groves of trees and brush in the lowlands of Eastern Washington for overshoe Eastern birds. It is a big deal, and they're finding lots of birds um, more tied to Eastern North America. <clears throat> Moving uphill from the um, riparian, you come to and um, Ponderosa Pine, you have the mixed conifer zone where there is a high conifer species diversity and it's getting wetter. It's sort of a spillover zone from Western Washington, but not really. And this is the fire zone of Eastern Washington, part of the ecology of the forests here. It's woodpecker heaven too. Within weeks after the fire, beetle numbers explode in these dying trees and attracts lots of woodpeckers, including the black bat with a black bat in a yellow crown and the American three-toed with a yellow crown, but with a white bat. It's a smaller bird too. You usually see the American three-toed at slightly higher elevations than the black bat. And there's often spruce in the habitat of the American three-toed. A really lovely bird in the mixed conifer forest, Williamson sapsucker. This is the male, and they favor forests with at least some large trees. That's the deciduous conifer, golden yellow in the fall. Now here's the female, totally different beast, originally described as a separate species back in the 1800s, until some uh, astute observer noticed well, that female so-and-so woodpecker is um, going into the same hole as the male. We better reevaluate this and they figured out they're the same species. Williamson Sapson. Pileated woodpeckers. You'd think we'd, I'd run out of woodpeckers to talk about. <clears throat> Pileated is common in the mixed conifer. You know, the species that drills the big oval holes. Rufus hummingbirds of west side species is also common here. <clears throat> and this is where birders keen to swell their list come for the spruce grouse, exceptionally tame chicken. Its survival depends on kind of being quiet, and just maintaining a low profile. And it spends the winter up tall in tall, dense conifers in summer on the ground. Okanagan and Northeast Washington are core habitats for this. <clears throat> Stellar's jays here are darker than in the Southwest. A uh, kind of a snazzy bird, common, but still some, something great to look at. Owls are a big de deal in our East, east Side forests, <clears throat> many species. The barred owl is actually a newcomer here. Gives me a smile to do that. 
but it invaded the state about 1965 and is now common down to Northern California. And it's clearly displacing spotted owls where they're, wherever the two come in contact. Sawwet owls, uh, this is key habitat for sawwet owls, and they'll be starting to toot pretty soon. And it's also core habitat for the pygmy owl, which is smaller than the sawwet, bluebird size, in fact, that's actually a little terrorist to small birds in the forest. <clears throat> but it's got to eat too, you know. Great gray owls are sparse residents in the Okanagan Highlands and Blue Mountains. And it's a bird I've been interested in for 30 years. And see Washington Birds, Volume 6, for a paper on the first nesting of these birds at the Avila Snow Park, a known site. And it was here in, I think, 1991 that Ike Eisenhardt, a friend from Seattle, and I were in the Havila area and we split up to cover more ground and I returned saying, I think I heard one, but I couldn't see it. And he said, really, really? And uh, it turned out to be the nest, a broken off stump, uh, snag. That's the first uh, nesting in the state. <clears throat> and I contend that the gray gray owls in the Northern part of our state have moved in in response to selective logging. Selective logging has opened the forest a bit and allowed an increase in number of rodents and gophers, favored prey of the great gray owl. It's a great habitat for Hammond's flycatchers. <clears throat> and I won't go into the long story of Teddy Roosevelt's first question to John Muir but you can look it up online. Apparently it's true. <clears throat> Creepers are a good test of a uh, aging male's hearing. If you can still hear a creeper or a golden crown kinglet, you still have lots of life left in your birding years. Very high pitch. A very thrush is a uh, summer resident of this zone an altitudinal migrant, and they're now down in the lowlands still because we're having snowy weather. And it visits yards with mountain ash in the wintertime, which includes our yard in Yakima. Warbler diversity in the mixed conifers is kind of low, but Townsend's warbler is the characteristic one. And it's another example of a neotropical migrant most of them wintering in Mexico and Central America and wintering in the Northwest, and summering in the Northwest. <clears throat> the commonest warbler is the yellow rump warbler, so-called Audubon's warbler. Always a lovely sight. And sometimes in migration, you can see just flocks of these things. Sometimes I think it's bad weather has forced them into a, uh, uh, low elevation canyons. But sometimes you can see 50 to 80 of these things in a concentrated area in May. A totally lovely bird, another neotropical migrant. A resident, red-breasted nuthatch. If you get this guy to call, it will bring, and curious about you, it will bring in lots of other birds from the forest. They just want to know what this guy is antsy about. Somehow, uh, Red-breasted nuthatches just cannot relax. They're always yank, 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 yank. <clears throat> Juncos are the common sparrows of the mixed conifer. And during spruce budworm outbreaks, numbers of evening grosbeaks will skyrocket. Lose that outbreak of insects and the grosbeaks go somewhere else. <clears throat> Oops. What I'm driving at here is diversity creates a big bird list. And it turns out in summer, if you concentrate on low elevation to high elevation and a variety of habitats, you can amass a superb list of birds. 
150 to 175 in a weekend in eastern Washington. This would be about May 25th, 20th to 25th. So if you hit some mountain lakes and marshes, um, you're going to get grebes, ducks, and shorebirds, and swallows, and maybe even a loon that likes, it must have secluded lakes. Okay, uh, <clears throat> including ear grebes, but mainly on alkaline ponds. A favorite place for me is the Beaver Lake Marshes, east of Chisa, where there's south slopes with clams and north slopes with goshawks. And mixed in there will be black terns, a lovely sight. Barrow's golden eyes are common in the region which is a bird that nests in woodpecker holes and the ducklings fall to the ground following mama to water. The braying call of redneck grebes is diminishing in Northeastern Washington, but you can still find it. <clears throat> Unlike the Western Washington um, wetlands, yellow throats aren't quite as numerous in Eastern Washington Northeastern river valleys have the most because that's the moist, moistest part. <clears throat> Ospreys used to be incredibly common in certain areas in the Ponderé, but I think cormorants have, um, you know, I, I don't know what cormorants have done, but there are far fewer. I once counted 38 nests around us in the Ponderé. And last time I was there, I couldn't find one. I go, and the only thing that's changed is cormorants have proliferated. Read John Muir for his, his description of the dipper, his favorite bird. <clears throat> Disappearing in the Northwest, very sadly. In fact, if there's more than a dozen or so birds east of the Cascade Crest, it might be, that might be about it. And spotted out. One of the great tragedies in our bird, bird life scene in the last 40 years. <clears throat> Goshawks is another sought after species of the mixed conifer, preying on squirrels, rabbits, and grouse. Habitat loss is a primary driver in their declining numbers. <clears throat> Ever higher in the mountains, you break out of the continuous trees into the subalpine, dominated by subalpine fir and white bark pine. The so-called parkland near the upper limits is an open forest with lot gorgeous wildflowers. Clark's nutcracker is a or used to be a common bird here. I believe it's declining due to the loss of white bark pine. I don't really have time to go into the loss of white bark pines, but as a keystone species, its loss is not good news for species dependent on uh, large pine seeds. <clears throat> More a generalist, the Canada jay, formerly known as gray jay or whiskey jack, um, is in common in the subalpine. And I'm going to assert that the most fabulous song in our forest is the ethereal song of the hermit thrush. Not often seen, but a really lovely bird. Kinglet, ruby crown kinglets are common in Northeastern Washington. The closer you come to the Cascade Crest, the fewer there are. They seem to like a more continental forest than anything close to the coast. Mountain bluebirds are common in open meadows high up, as is the olive-sided flycatcher. Quick three beers, especially in uh, tall trees in burns. This bird goes all the way to the Amazon for winter. <clears throat> You're certainly going to see siskins in the subalpine. They love meadows, craving dandelion and alder seeds. 
I'll receive more in winter. Mm, 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 mm. Goes the dusky grouse from shrub step to subalpine in Eastern Washington. 30 years ago, I became interested in the status of the boreal owl in the Okanagan, wrote the forest. If they knew anything about it, they said, no, we don't, but we'd like to know more. Will you help us? So they sponsored a box, box project and we put up 50 boxes or 55 or something, which confirmed nesting in 1992. Every single one of those boxes burned during the huge fires 15 or 20 years ago. And to see boreal owls now best to go to sunrise on Mount Rainier or at Salmo Mountain in the far Northeast. Some other spruce kingdom birds in the far Northeast, boreal chickadee, pine grosbeak, and the eruptive white-winged crossbill, of which there don't seem to be any this winter. You have to go north into Canada. <clears throat> I should mention, remember I mentioned there were more ecosystems than um, the 10 or so I labeled. And that's because we have some spillovers from Western Washington at the Cascade Crest. The spillover ecosystem is mountain hemlock. Lower in elevation is silver fir, which often show those bent trunks because of snow creep, such a heavy snowpack, it causes the, the tree to bend. <clears throat> and in the far northeastern um, part of the state, Pend Oreille, you have western hemlock and, uh, and uh, western red cedar forest. It's really wet in the far northeast as along you know, low elevations east of Snoqualmie Pass or Twist Pass. And west side birds, like these spillover ecosystems. All birds common in Western Washington. The highest ecosystem is the Alpine. Generally in Washington, poorly developed because it's so recently glacier free. And also this, many of the slopes are rugged. But there's only four breeding species up there. <clears throat> but I like to say there's a unique part of Washington's um, Alpine, and that's in the far north, northeast Cascades uh, in the Pisaten, where, where many summits were overridden by glaciers, rounded tops, and the Alpine is much better developed. Pippets um, favor seeps and small streams. Rosy finches, rocky areas near alpine vegetation. Horn larks up there are not the yellow-throated Columbia Basin subspecies, but rather the alpina, which has a whitish throat, which by the way is identical to my eye to Arctica from the very Canadian far north. Anyways, look for these larks in drier habitats in the alpine, such as third, third burrows on Mount Rainier. Ah, the special prize, the white-tailed ptarmigan. That can be incredibly difficult to find, but always a real treat to blunder into them. <clears throat> the best place to look for them is the high north uh, Pisaten, the most, most common up there. <clears throat> a, a real treat in the fall in the alpine are raptors migrating south overhead, using the ridges for um, thermals to aid them in their migration. As with vagrant searching, I need to mention winter in eastern Washington is an incredible time to go birding. Uh, places like the Waterville Plateau, shown here, the Okanagan Highlands uh, attract a contingent of northern birds that uh, Shep and company have shared to lots and lots of wasp members 
over a number of years. Here's just a sampling of what you may find, not all of them on each trip, uh, but Chep's trips score pretty high. I'm, I'm always impressed. Rough-legged hawk, bohemian waxwing, sharp-tailed grouse, snowy owl, snow buntings, northern shrike, common red bull, and perhaps the most elusive of all uh, is the gerfalcon. Anyways, that's a tour of uh, Eastern Washington from low to high, from uh, dry to wet, and all the uh, ecosystems one may find there. And if all this has proven just way too much for you, to, you know, how am I going to learn all these birds? Well, how about join a tour? Uh, it's probably the simplest way to to get a handle of all these birds. Anyways, I've really enjoyed this and. Um, uh, it is recorded, so if you care to revisit it and slow down a bit, because I, I tried to keep within the time limit. All right. Well, that's questions. time for questions, I guess. Um, anybody who joined us after Andy started to talk uh, won't realize that Elaine is not with us tonight. And Matt Bartles has kindly agreed to be Elaine with the chat. Um, but I'd like to tell you what what a visual treat this has been. And I'm going to be taking notes. I'm coming back to this once it's posted and taking notes. It was no wonder you see such amazing things because you see the world in, in, in technical is the wrong word. It is just such a rich view that you have of the world. And thank you so much for sharing it. And now I would like to invite Matt to help us out with questions that might've been put in the chat or and encourage anybody who would like to um, unmute and uh, turn your camera on and ask your question directly. Thanks again to Echo, Vicki, um, Andy, always great to hear you talk about these places and to think about the fine distinctions you can make as you pay more attention to what's going on in, in all of Eastern Washington, but the much variety is always great to hear this. Um, I had a question from Monique that wanted to ask specifically about ferruginous hawks. Wonder, she's wondering, is, is anybody studying ferruginous hawks in Washington state range, habitat loss, et cetera? Uh, she says Cornell Labs list, or labels them as low concern for conservation. So are they still more common farther south and east? Why would they... Why would their prey base um, be diminished more here in central and eastern Washington than in southwest and Great Plains? So what's uh, different about here that hurts them? Well, I disagree with the low concern. I, I strongly disagree with that. I believe this species is declining over its core Great Plains distribution, not as badly as here because they still have keystone species like prairie dogs. We don't have prairie dogs in the Northwest, but the native squirrels and jackrabbits, on which they historically depended, are, are vanishing in Washington, whether it's disease or habitat, I don't know, but it could be rodenticides too. Um, the, so I strongly agree with that assertion. Fruginous hawk is in trouble. I'd like to uh, volunteer that Jason Fedora, who works for the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife, I think it was two years ago, came and gave a talk. And if you go to the WASS YouTube channel um, and look for that talk specifically about the ferruginous hawk, he has very much been studying it. And I think you would find it well worth your while. Thank you. Yeah. Got it. Test for you, Andy, on your slide navigation speeds. Um, Nancy asks, um, what slide was directly before the very thrush slide? She said she thinks she missed a slide there and wondered if you could pull that one up. Uh, <laughs> you know, there were two very thrushes and I'm afraid I've got to get out of this and I might mess it up. Why don't we take another question while perhaps Ellen is oh, researching this? Awesome. I'm wondering, Andy, so hearing you talk, we learned the variety or the, the value of the variety and going to various different places. 
But where do you dig in? Where do you like to go back to again and again of all these different places? What's kind of your sweet zone um, when you go out to choose a place that you find yourself returning to a lot? Uh, I love the Okanagan because the Okanagan has all the habitats compressed into a narrow valley. And it's, it's an easy place to bird and just offers superb biodiversity. Awesome. Uh, by, by the way, there's a Canadian contingent of birders who will agree with me on this because that's their, quote, pocket desert. The only <laughs> place in Canada where they have the shrub step. Plus, they have all the other habitats we have. So <laughs> if you go to the Okanagan eBird hotspot, there's, I think, 360 species, whereas ours only has like 315 or so, maybe 20. And the only reason for that is they have way, way more birders canvassing their habitats than we do. We, <laughs> we need 10 chef thorps. <laughs> Weekly trips to the Okanagan, a new wasp requirement. <laughs> yeah. So the Okanagan is where it's at. Can you okay. see the screen now that shows the slide before the buried thrush? Is it golden crown kinglet? Golden crown kinglet. I think I blew by that one. I don't know how. <laughs> I would have said the same thing about this bird as I did about the creeper. It's a good test yeah. for an aging male. Can you hear that? C C C. A question from Gary asking, do you have any favorite sites in Blue Mountains for finding green tail towies? Uh, Biscuit Ridge seems to be the place now, um, which often you have to clamber downhill to the shrubby thickets from the log from the ridge road there. But the eBird hotspot there is probably pretty close. It looks as if it's yeah, I think that. I'm assuming folks know how to navigate eBird when I <laughs> casually say, I'll just go to eBird. <laughs> Andy, you might share what you shared with me about um, going to the, I mean, that was, that was a very simple way to get to um, the frequency of sighting of some of these birds that people are really interested in seeing. Yeah, you just go to the count explore in eBird explore and then type in county. For you, you're going to Anza Brego, so that's San Diego County. Oh, and a bit of Imperial. And then you hit on navigation, and that will be bar charts. Go to the species you want to see and hit on the satellite pin. That assumes you know what the satellite pin that looks like. And look for red pins, which are recent sightings. Right. Thank you so much. I do, it, so I do much. it every day. I do it every day, many times. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Yeah. It's one of those things to do it often enough that it becomes sort of a second nature thing when you really need to pull it up. It's, yeah, it's, it's very easy. And, and many birders make it incredibly easy with GPS data. I mean, you can't get much more fine tuned than that. If you look for a checklist within the uh, recent sightings of the GPS point. I mean, that takes you within five to 10 meters of where they were. <laughs> Assuming they're not messing with you. <laughs> Next question. Awesome. So um, can you talk a little bit about ex or explain the origins of the lithosols? Oh, that great, great question. Great question. And that's from Reg. Yeah. Um, in particularly south of, say, the Beasley Hills and in south central Washington, <clears throat> the Ice Age floods dumped uh, megatons of silt in the southern Columbia Basin. And it's a windy place here, uh, south central Washington. And the predominant winds are from the southwest. And I think the theory is these deposits have been shifted around by the incessant winds so that southwest 
slopes, slopes and ridge tops tend to be the barest, and then the soils are thicker or deeper on the north, from northwest to north, and less so on northeast. I don't know why that is. But anyway, southwest and south slopes, and particularly scalp. That would be my that my rationale. <clears throat> Interesting, yeah. Last chance for questions in the Q&A section here. I've been seeing a lot of people putting in, thanks, Andy, for the overview. So lots of grateful listeners today. Oh, um, you're, oh. you're all welcome. I, I hope it's clear. I really enjoy um, sharing my love for this these landscapes. And you had a very large audience, uh, about 114 people <laughs> signed in and were with us for almost the entire time. And some people I suspect are gonna be like, I am, I'm gonna come back and I'm gonna take notes <laughs> and uh, put this put this to use. It's gonna be very, very valuable. Thank you so much. And now so comes much. the quiz. <laughs> the quiz. <laughs> <laughs> no, keep in mind, what I conveyed was rapid fire of 45 years of traipsing the ground out here. So it didn't it doesn't come overnight. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, many of us had the great pleasure and benefit of, of birding with you. And just the, when you would look at a landscape and say, look at the aspect and the slope and things like that, which I just natively don't do. It just opens your eyes in ways that are really helpful for the future and uh, really appreciate your sharing your approach and your expertise. It's just wonderful. So Vicki, okay. on your trip to California, this is really obvious in California. You'll notice it everywhere. Every bend in the highway mm -hmm. changes in vegetation mm -hmm. depending on your orientation to the sun. Oh, and elevation. <clears throat> So I'm going to be to quizzing. I'm going to be quizzing you. <laughs> uh, look out. Okay. Well, thank you everyone for joining us tonight.